we've been talking uh, together about uh, biblical events and, and, and people from biblical history and just the, the, the evidences for the, their historical reality and how their lives comport with the Bible. But there's another uh, area that we really need to talk about, and that is the Bible itself. And, you know, today uh, people are, are saying the Bible's been changed. It's, it's one of the most... Uh, uh, maybe viral ideas that's out there is the Bible's been changed. Uh, the, the text of scripture isn't what was originally written. We have something different. Or, or they say the parts uh, of what were in the original Bible have been taken out and other things put in. So it, it, they say we cannot trust it. Um, and of course, one of, the, one of the lines of reasoning is that uh, the, the Bible, like if taking the Old Testament scripture, they say, well, when you open up your Old Testament in an English Bible today, you're, you're not reading what, what people read 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, let alone 2,000 years ago or before. They say this has all changed. Uh, but there was an important discovery, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about that. Um, maybe we could just discuss a little bit about the Dead Sea Scrolls and its significance and how it relates to this whole idea that the Bible's been changed over the course of time. So who'd like to start uh, with that? Such an important subject, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, I, yeah, it's an incredibly uh, important subject because uh, Dead Sea uh, Scrolls discovered in 1947, right? Uh, primarily Hebrew text from the Old Testament, plus a bunch of other documents, commentaries, and other, other things written by this community of people. The, the Qumran community. The Qumran community, right. that's right. And uh, who lived in the region of the Dead Sea. Uh, extraordinary discovery because prior to that time, the oldest Hebrew text we had was from 900 AD or so. And so these texts go back almost a thousand years prior to that. And uh, the amazing thing is all the years of, of, of uh, examining them and looking at them and reading them has shown substantial uh, maintenance of the text over that long period of time that it, in fact, was not substantially changed. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is an extraordinary discovery and one that uh, merits discussion because I think a lot of people aren't, aren't familiar with it or don't realize the significance of, of the discovery mm -hmm. in that regard. Yes. Yeah. Every uh, biblical book is represented there with the exception of Esther. I think Esther's referred to in some of the commentaries, but no text of Esther. Right. Mm -hmm. Most of the books it's just fragments, but we have a complete uh, book of Isaiah. I think there's a couple of copies mm -hmm. of Isaiah. Yeah. And uh, the Psalms are well represented, and uh, some of the books uh, more so than others, and some just a few scraps, unfortunately. But uh, it is, it's amazing, because they do go back to the time just before Christ, the first century BC, and up until AD 70, the destruction of the temple. Uh, right in that uh, time period. So they're uh, 2,000 years old, as you said, Henry, extremely right. important. Extraordinary discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, you, uh, you know about this uh, uh, through your studies. Um, were there major changes? Did they rewrite the text? Did we find the text later on uh, compared to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, what kind of changes were there? Of course, first of all, there's no New Testament in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. The Dead Sea Scrolls are only <coughs> Old Testament books, no, no New Testament books. People every now and then will say, oh, there's some New Testament. There's been no New Testament books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we admit, if, if you read what scholars are talking about, there's a word here, there's a phrase there that they still argue about, that, that the Dead Sea Scrolls says this and the, the traditional Hebrew text says this, but over and over and over again, so very much down to very, down to very letters of words, are found to be consistent between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, the copies of the Old Testament that we have today, and of course it gets translated into our own language, just like it's been translated for thousands of years into different languages, and and scholars again are carefully looking at what they have from one language to another. 
And there's just no reason to doubt today that the Bible we have in English is very, very authentic with the Bible of the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the way down through the Hebrew text. Scholars will argue about a word, a phrase, or occasionally a letter, but it's amazingly historically accurate, the same stuff. Yeah, and that's the kind of discussions that I have with many people. Uh, they're surprised to hear that the Old Testament text basically was not changed. Uh, and as you say, there are some, there's some uh, letters, phrases, things like that, but the substance is there. It, it's extraordinary that the copying of the text of the Old Testament was kept so accurately. Uh, it's important for people to know when they open up the text of the Old Testament that they're reading a reliable text and they don't have to wonder whether or not this is actually what was written or what was, what was kept. We believe we have a reliable text of Scripture. Now, one of the, one of the side issues maybe uh, from this discussion is the book of Daniel. I want to just talk about that briefly. Daniel was, uh, is highly criticized because Daniel actually predicts the future. He talks about, uh, he's, he's, he's predicting what will happen in the world through three kingdoms. Well, he talks about four kingdoms. He starts with Babylon, he talks about the Medo-Persian Empire, and, and probably many people are not familiar with, with, with even that empire, but he talked about the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, predicted that they would come. Now, skeptics would say, well, you can't have predictive prophecy because no one can predict the future because that's, that's not scientific or whatever. <laughs> that's what they would say. And so that can't happen. And so they'll move uh, Daniel down the corridors of time further down. Now, they only move him down to before the Roman Empire, so he still ends up predicting the Roman Empire. But they change the date of when the, the writing occurred. Why do, why do people want to try to move the dates of when biblical books were written. Why do they do that? Who'd like to jump in on that one? Well, you're right. It, it's if if there is a supernatural God who can give information to predict the future, mm -hmm. then that's a person. That's a force in the universe to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. And I'm really not comfortable with recognizing and having to deal with somebody like that. So I don't see any reason why someone like that can and should exist. But in fact, the Bible is full of predictive prophecy. And, and so many things that were said, we find out later on, historically did happen, that we're going to have to deal with that. And once I, once I decide that there really is a God, then all of this opens up. Yes. Once I really admit that there's somebody out there bigger than me who can do stuff beyond my understanding, mm -hmm. everything changes. Yes. And it's important for people to know that the God that we serve, the God that we love, is a God that cares about them. Now, we, we're discussing all these subjects about uh, these intellectual scientific issues, but we do that because we're trying to help everyone to understand that there's a good foundation that they can stand on to know what's really real. But out of that comes a God who actually cares about them and loves them. And it's important for people to know that. Scott, about this predictive prophecy, and, and the Bible is full of it, there, mm -hmm. there's lots of it. Yes. But, but really, when you, when you think about it, the prophets just didn't sit down and just tell the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we often use the, the, the phrase, prophets were, were forth telling, foretelling the future, and forth telling a message to the people. Yes. And really, most of the predictive prophecy comes in the, in the realm of forth telling to the people, you people better cut this out. You better stop, you better change, because mm -hmm. if you don't, this is what God is going to do. And so the prophets weren't just spouting off stuff that they're popping into their heads or that God just dropped on them. It was always in the context of dealing with issues of their present day. And the prophet said, look, if you people don't do this, this is what God's going to do. Now, you and I can walk around and say that today, and we may be 50% right. Mm -hmm. But when God spoke to the prophets, he said, tell them this. And then if they don't do, then this is what's going to happen. Predictive 
prophecy comes out of the foretelling, dealing mm-hmm. with issues of their current day. And then it it actually was fulfilled later on because they didn't do, or if they did do, and God honored or God dealt with those issues. Yes. Another important point here, too, is is how we define God Uh, in terms of God of the Bible is an absolute self-existent being. That means that he controls all things, that he has planned all things, and that he knows the future and controls the future and all all those kind of things that we're talking about. Um, A lot of times in our cultural environment, people will allow us as Christians to believe in God, quote unquote, but they will want to define who he is for us. Let's say, this is someone that you keep in your head or someone that helps you deal with your moral problems or helps you with your marriage. And he does do those things. He he does all those things. But he's far greater than that. Um, And so when our definition of God is limited, he's not God anymore or God as, as we would describe him from from the Bible, he presents himself to us, and we uh, accept his definition for himself. Um, but if he's less than that, if he can't do these things, then from our perspective, he's not a god worth worshiping. He's not worth worth our eternal uh, trust for sure, and he's not able to uh, know the future. He has actually planned the future, and so obviously he can also tell us of the future, and so. Um, so we're forced to define God in a way that's foreign to how God has defined himself. And so we have to be, we have to be careful as Christians. Right. We have to say to people, yeah. not allow that definition to be set by ideas about God that are foreign to who he is. And so we're driving people back to the Bible. Correct. Get back to the Bible. Open up. Know that it's dependable. Know that it's reliable. Um, you know, Scott, uh, talking about prophecy, many of the Old Testament prophecies look forward to the Messiah, mm-hmm. to Jesus yeah. Christ. And uh, that's powerful. Uh, if a- any of the uh, viewers uh, watching this want to read just one sample, read Isaiah 53, mm-hmm. written 700 B.C. or so. If that's not talking about Jesus, I don't know who it is talking. It is so specific. Just read yes. that one chapter of the Old Testament and, yeah. and decide for yourself whether right. or not there's predictive prophecy and yes. whether or not there's prophecies of a coming Messiah that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Cal- right. Calculations vary, but I, I think it's 400 and plus different prophetic yeah types of, of information given in the Old Testament that point to the Son of God coming into the world and suffering and dying mm-hmm. on behalf of his people. So it's an extraordinary thing, and it's, it's further evidence of, of God's sovereign control over all things, that we can trust him in the context of the world we live in, and, and mm-hmm. we can trust him for our eternal uh, future. Yes, yes. We, we, uh, we share a common belief and understanding that the God of the Bible is the living God, uh, that the Bible was was spoken by him. And this is why we believe that the Bible is true. But again, for many who are just beginning to grapple with these issues, they want to know, you know, they, they hear all the time, they, they've listened to some TV show or heard something about the, the Old Testament that has been changed, it's not reliable, but we're here to say no, indeed, The Dead Sea Scrolls are a wonderful example of how the Bible has been maintained. And that even if you don't believe it, even if you don't believe in the the miraculous God that that we're we're talking about, you can know that the text of Scripture is indeed a reliable text. And that's very unique because Mm -hmm. if you look at any other ancient document where we have a number of copies, you'll see that they're always heavily edited and revised and changed and shaped mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. fit the uh, revisers' uh, notions of what it, what it should say and using it for political purposes or, or whatever. The Bible's totally unique in that aspect, and it's because the scribes had very strict yeah. procedures for mm-hmm. copying. They counted the letters in each line and number mm-hmm. of uh, lines on the page and all kinds of things they had to check and double check to yes. make sure their copy was 100% accurate and uh, repeated the previous copy exactly. 
Yes. And so yeah. uh, I think God providentially has had his hand upon his mm. Bible all mm. through the centuries to make sure that it was transmitted very, very accurately.